Well, good morning and welcome to the Gathering Church. My name is John Mark Redwine. I'm the lead pastor, and I'm so happy to see everybody today. Man, I'm glad you're here. If it's your first Sunday, what a great Sunday you picked to be with us. It's the beginning of summer. Summer officially starts today. Yes, yes. I don't care what the calendar says. Summer at the Gathering is the calendar. This is your calendar now. Welcome. We got so many fun things happening this summer here. I can't wait. I'm going to eat so much mac and cheese next Sunday. I'm going to be in a full coma for the rest of the day. I'm going to start my blood pressure medicine on Monday. Can't wait. I can't wait for that big party on the third, y'all. It's going to be so good. Well, hey, uh, if it's your first time joining us, uh, or maybe you've been here for a little while, may- maybe you've been thinking about, man, I like this church. This is the best church ever. I love it. The pastor's so funny. I, w- I really wonder what my next step would be if I wanted to know more about it or become a part of it. Um, we have had something called Growth Track at the gathering from the very beginning. And Growth Track really has just been a, a, an opportunity for you to come and learn a little bit about us and for us to help you discover your purpose and find your place here in the gathering church. And we have changed the name of Growth Track. Now, I only change names of things at the church if we make them simpler, if it becomes simpler. We've changed the name from Growth Track which is kind of weird, right? Growth track, am I going to go there because I don't feel like I grew enough as a young man and I'll get taller eventually? Am I going to grow emotionally, spiritually, physically? I don't know. Um, We've changed the name to step one, to step one, because if you want to know what your first step is at the Gathering Church, I'm so glad you asked. It's step one. And it's right outside, immediately following service. Right after service, if you are interested, you got questions, it's just 20 minutes long. We would love for you to join us at step one right over here after service. We'd love to see you there. I got one more thing that I want to share with you before I get into uh, the message today. There has been a lot of change in our church this past year. And if you've been around for a while, you've seen that, you've experienced that, maybe you've lived that. There's been a lot of transition in leadership and, and all kinds of stuff here. And, and so um, one of the things that I've been thinking about as, as your pastor and as the leader of this organization is how we can make all those changes and transitions and, and the next pandemic that comes upon us, how we can lead through those things better in the future. And so with that in mind, what I want to do just for a second, I won't get into the whole nitty gritty of it with you this morning, but I want to introduce you to some folks. Um, we have been adjusting our leadership structure at the church. We have... Uh, always had a system of elders as a church. Elders, if you don't know, if you're new to church, is a very churchy word for older people. And so (laughs) it's a churchy word for um, leadership that comes from within the church, leadership that comes from within the church. People uh, who are a part of our church who we ask uh, to help us carry the weight. Now, it comes from within the church. Also, it really just comes from outside of staff because as a church, we've always satisfied that with something called we call overseers, meaning uh, accountability and leadership for our church, uh, things like approving the budget and salaries and stuff like that. I know if you're like, I just want to hear preaching today. I don't want to hear about business stuff. It's going to be over in two minutes. Just zone out for a second, but everyone else pay attention. The overseers are lead pastors of other churches who provide accountability and leadership to me and our staff. Their names are Kurt Bradford, Andy Wood, Ernest Smith, and Mitch Lunsford. Mitch will be here preaching in two weeks, and I can't wait for you to meet him. And so the overseers have satisfied that, but we really wanted someone from within our church. And so we're uh, putting together a structure of two boards, a board of advisors and a board of trustees, and the board of overseers, the board of advisors, and the board of trustees combined will be the elders of the gathering church. Right now, the board of trustees and advisors are one board for a little while, and they're the best people ever. And I want to show you their pictures and tell you their names because, listen, they're already blessing me so much. They're blessing you in ways that you don't know. They're helping carry the weight in ways I didn't even know that I needed. And I just think it's good for you to know uh, who these people are when 
and you see them, that they're they really helping to lead this church into the next season so well. And so that just real quickly, we got their pictures up there, and they are Stephen and Cassie Mary. Stephen and Cassie Mary are so incredible. They've been leading our prayer team for a long time at the church. If you don't know, this is a praying church. This is a church where we believe that, that prayer changes everything, that it really does. And, uh, and so Stephen and Cassie have been leading that team for a long time, and, and now they're stepping into this area of leadership, and I can't wait uh, for them to be a part of this board. They're doing so awesome already. Mark and Mary McC- Clear, Mark and Mary McClear on the board. Marker and Mary have uh, have been in my life group for a while, and I've just really enjoyed getting to know them. They're so much smarter than me, both of them, and so together they're like a thousand times smarter than me, and it has blessed me already. Um, Stephanie and Brad Huckster are on the team. Many of you have been around. You've known them. They've been with us. Uh, I got a, a great story about that. Stephanie has really been a part of our church since before we started, sent a, a, a care package before she had ever been to this church with a coffee mug in it that I drink coffee out of this morning, okay? Awesome people that care for us, and then uh, Paul and Heath Mackey, Paul and Heath Mackey, which um, if, uh, if you don't know Paul and Heath, they are our life group coordinators. They, they help lead our life groups here at the church, and they love this church so well, and so we're just so honored to have this team together. That's who they are, and now you know them. Bring them all your problems and leave me alone. Let's get started. Let's get started. Today what I want to talk about really is, uh, is, is what, we're gonna, what, what we do now as a people. What do we do now? What now? And I promise that I'm not just going to talk about COVID stuff for the rest of my career as a pastor, but what I really feel like we need to talk about for a minute is where we are in this cultural moment, where we are in this, in this, in this part, in this, in this moment of humanity, because it has been strange. It has been a weird year. And it was like the whole world suddenly came to a stop. And sometime, I always thought it would happen all at once. I remember last March really just thinking, hey, two weeks, two weeks to flatten the curve. Two weeks and we'll be through and this will be over and we'll get back to life and it'll all just restart again. But that's not how it happened, is it? Over months and months and a year and 15 and 16 months that have gone by, as we've made good strides as a nation to putting the pandemic behind us, it's kind of like the world is slowly kicking back into motion. It's, it's getting going again. Things are restarting before we're noticing that they're restarting. Things are happening all around us quickly. And as we move to the other side of the season that we were on, what I want to talk about is some of the things that we stopped and some of the things that we've started. Just for a few moments this morning, I want to talk about some of the things that, that stopped in March of 2020 that can pretty much just stay there forever. I don't ever want them back. I want to talk about a thing that we started up during that pandemic that we can leave behind. And then I'll talk about a couple of things that we need to get going again. That it is time for us to restart again as we move to the other side of this thing. I don't want us to miss the significance of the moment that we're in. I think that we have a unique opportunity as a culture to look at where we are right now and where we've been and decide where we want to go. And so let's make sure we make the best possible decision with that and that we do it in a way that's going to benefit us on the other side. I don't know about you, but I've been in a lot of reflection lately over everything that's happened and where we are now. And so that's just what I want to share with you this morning. I'll get started. I think one of the things that, that was, has always been maybe a big part of our culture, but especially in the last decade or so, is hurry. And I think we need to leave the hurry behind forever. Who remembers the part of the pandemic when people were just gardening again? Who, who remembers the part of the pandemic where we were trying to think up hobbies that we could do inside of our house? I, there was one moment in the pandemic where I was so bored, I built a patio, just built a patio, just made it, dug it out of the ground, had a buddy come with some concrete, and we just made a patio. This was the greatest part of the pandemic, right? Woke up every day and did some work on the computer, had 30 Zoom meetings, and then wondered to myself, what am I going to do now? What are we going to do? I can't go anywhere, so that's a no. 
I'm just going to be. And that, that was kind of abrupt and, and uncomfortable for a minute, right? And then all of a sudden, I don't know if this happened for you. It did happen for me. I want to say sometime around this time of year last year. Maybe it was June or July where I was kind of like, well, this isn't so bad. <laughs> I could do this for a little bit, a little bit longer, I think. I don't mind. Nobody's calling me. Nobody expects to see me anywhere. Nobody needs anything from me. Everybody's expectations for me are at an all-time low. I'm into this. How long can we make this last for? I feel, I, feel like I feel like I could use it for a little. We lived in such a world of hurry. Our culture has been obsessed with packing the calendar. We've wired ourselves for it. We've been working long hours. We travel all the time. We overschedule events and sports and obligations. We constantly check our phones and our emails. Some of us have the reflex where we're just constantly keeping our phone in our hand so we can see if anything happens. We compulsively look for updates. We're checking for notifications. We want to see if somebody needs anything from me right now or if there's some news that I might have missed. I want to know if there's somewhere I'm supposed to be. Let me scan that calendar. We lived in a world of hurry and then the world came to a screeching halt. Those first few weeks were pretty uncomfortable for a lot of us. We were antsy, uncomfortable, anxious, stir-crazy, binging TV, watching Tiger King for goodness sakes, just, just staring at screens as much as we could to distract ourselves from what was going on. And then after a time, it settled down. And, and maybe I, I talked to a lot of people who said, well, I've never had this much time with my family before. And I found that I enjoy it. I found that I enjoy these people. I've enjoyed the lack of obligations, the lack of uh, responsibilities. And I believe that the reason we could admit enjoying that is because we were not created to live in the constant hurry that we placed ourselves in. Ecclesiastes 4, 6, I read this last Sunday, says, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. It's better to have less of whatever it is you think you need and to have peace in your life than it is to have everything that you want but to be constantly chasing after an ideal that doesn't exist. I think we need to leave hurry in the past and not bring it into our present. I think we need to schedule less. I think we need to, we need to learn how to Sabbath. You know, I was talking to some friends this morning, and we were talking about how busy this last month or so has been for me. I don't know if it's been like that for you. The last month and two months has been crazy for me. It has been all of the things that didn't happen for the last year have happened in the last six weeks. I managed to pack in a full 15 months worth of events and parties and, and going to places and having dinner withs and, and meetings and work stuff and this, that, and the other thing all into a short period of time because that whole time we were paused, it was like the rubber band just kept stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching. And now it's, it's being let go. And we're having all these things that we're saying yes to. And, and there, there's so many of them are good things that we want to be a part of, but it is wearing us out. And so here's, here's my suggestion, that we leave the hurry in the past by bringing an ancient practice into the present. Let's learn how to Sabbath. Let's, let's bring Sabbath into the new world that we're building. I love the statement that Jesus made about Sabbath. The Pharisees had all these rules about what you could or couldn't do on Sabbath. And they made these rules to try and protect the holiness of that day. But they ended up just making it more difficult to exist on the Sabbath than anything else. And at one point, Jesus got in trouble for not following the strict Pharisee rules on Sabbath. And so uh, the, the Pharisees are getting on to him about it. They're trying to catch him in it. And he looks at the Pharisees and it says, Jesus said to them in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, he says, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. It was made for you to meet a need that you have. Sabbath wasn't made so you'd have more rules to follow. It was made so you would have a weekly moment to stop and rest. It's a system of checks and balances that God gave us so we wouldn't live our lives in a frenzy of hurriedness. 
We've got to set an entire day aside and use it for rest is what the scripture says. We talked about naps last week. Don't get me started again. I was full of myself on naps and snacks last Sunday. Go listen to it if you missed it. We'll talk about how important it is to your body that you recover sometimes. And you need that, and you need the spiritual recovery that comes with Sabbath. The Sabbath was always meant to be a both and in Scripture. In the ancient practice of Sabbath, there was always an element like what we're doing right now, where the people would worship together, where they would celebrate God together, study Scriptures together. And then there was an element of rest, maybe some napping, some, some eating. There's always lots of eating on the Sabbath. And, and the meal and all the things that they would do would center around God, would center around the spiritual around the things that God had done for them that week, around the, around the things that they were learning about God that week. And so if your body needs rest in the physical, it needs rest in the spiritual, it needs Sabbath so that you can go into the rest of your week knowing how to slow it down, how to leave the hurry behind. We gotta leave the hurry behind. We don't need to bring that back with us. Hurry. We have... Uh, obligations that are coming back that are making us hurry. And speaking of obligations, I want to encourage you that as we move into this new year, into this new season, that we can leave the toxic obligations behind. We need to leave the toxic obligations behind. Wasn't it good to have a nice, easy excuse to say no to things for a while? Am I right? Were there some things in your life that you were just like, mm, ah, so sorry, we just, don't, we just don't feel comfortable right now with that. Ugh, I just really, will, I would, I'm so sorry. I just, our family, we just don't feel comfortable, right? Oh, come on, some of, we've all done it. We've all done it. I see some of you judging me. We've all done it in the last year. There's been a few times where I was like, thank the Lord that I don't have to do that today. Yes, CDC, keep me away from them and that. Please. And it was, uh, it was good to have that excuse sometimes. So, some of us, uh, some of us have, have been a little bit uh, too comfortable using that excuse. Maybe there was a relationship in your life that's been toxic for you for a very long time. And COVID finally allowed you to create some boundaries there without feeling guilty about it. Maybe it was things that led you to hurry that were in your life. Maybe it was bad habits that you no longer had access to, that COVID created these boundaries between you and them. I think many of us have had toxic obligations in our lives that we were finally able to separate ourselves from in 2020. And I think as we move forward, we need to identify those things and we need to be okay with keeping those boundaries in place. You don't have to be living in a global pandemic to have healthy boundaries in your life. The Bible supports boundaries. It even supports them with people. Uh, in Titus chapter 3, verse 10, it talks about setting up boundaries for divisive people within the church. It says, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. That's a boundary. Jesus had 72 disciples, and then he had 12 disciples, and then he had three disciples, and then he had the one whom Jesus loved. He had boundaries in all of those relationships. Boundaries is an idea that is supported by the Bible, and yet often it is our faith that prevents us from creating boundaries. But I have to love them the way that Christ loves them. But I have to be willing to sacrifice my comfort on their behalf. But I have to serve, serve, serve. I have to work, work, work. I've got to do all of these things without any boundaries because it's who I am or who I'm supposed to be. But I need you to hear me say that those toxic obligations in your life, whether they're relationships or, or places that you had to go or things that you thought were expected of you, that it is okay for you to leave them in the past. There's always a process that we need to follow. It says here in Titus, it says you gotta make sure you've had the conversation. You gotta make sure you've tried to address the things that have made this relationship toxic. But if you've tried it and it's not getting any better, it's not changing, 
it's okay to create some boundaries. You shouldn't have to have a secret guilty pleasure from a global pandemic of being able to say no because something was so toxic in your life that you're so grateful that it's gone. You should be able to know when the right time is to draw boundaries. The only thing that I would suggest, I don't have time to just, I could teach a whole message on boundaries. In fact, I have before, and if you want it, text us, I'll send it to you. Here's what I would suggest when you're creating boundaries over these toxic obligations in your life. Don't make them alone. Bring somebody who you trust. I hope we just spent a whole series uh, of messages talking about how important it is to have someone in your life who you could be completely vulnerable with. Whoever that person is for you, bring them into the decision process. Invite them into it. Get some wisdom here. Get some guidance and some leadership and then set the boundaries. Leave those toxic obligations in the past. We need to leave our toxic obligations. We need to leave the selfishness. This one's unique on this list because I believe this one got worse during 2020. I'm just gonna be honest as your pastor and talk about this because I think it's my job to not only talk about the things that we wanna hear, but sometimes the things that we need to hear. Somewhere in the midst of watching the world fall apart around us, many of us felt more justified than ever in being more selfish than ever. We had to take care of ourselves. We got to do what's right for us. I got to think about me. I got to think about my family. I got I to do what I need to do for me. I need to do whatever makes me feel better. I need to make decisions that serve me. I'm talking about going to Ingalls and seeing that there are three packs of toilet paper left and buying all three because who knows what the future holds. You know who you are. We got to leave this selfishness behind us because church, this is not who we were created to be. We will find greater peace not when we are out to serve ourselves, but when we are looking for ways to serve others. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. His disciples were being selfish. They're arguing about who's going to be more important in his kingdom. They just didn't understand. I love the disciples because these people were right next to Jesus for three years and just most of the time had no idea what was going on. They knew it was important. They knew they needed to be there. They did not know who he was, what he was doing, where they were going, what he was talking about, or any of it. I love that because it gives me hope for me as a follower of Jesus. The disciples are are thinking that Jesus is going to set up a real kingdom, you know, a, a physical kingdom with lords and dukes and whatever else is in a kingdom. And they were arguing about who was going to be more important in this physical kingdom. Me, 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 me. I want to make sure that I'm first. I want to make sure that I'm taking care of me. I want to make sure that, that I'm important. I want to make sure that I'm the one that people notice. So I, 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 me, 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 me. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those who are under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you, must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. The message of Jesus was the opposite of a message of selfishness. It was a constant and consistent and clear message of selflessness. It's time for us to start thinking about how we can live outside of ourselves and put that mentality of self-first, self-preservation behind us. I think it's time to leave these things behind as we move forward, all of them, our our toxic obligations, our hurriedness, our, our selfishness. 
Well, I, think, I think we need to make a clear and conscious decision as a people to say, I'm all done with that. I'm not bringing them with me as I jump back into civilization, as life starts moving forward at a rapid pace again. I want to have the state of mind to be able to decide who I am going to be as time goes forward. If you do not make a decision about what you're going to leave behind you and what you're going to start all over again, it'll all just happen. It'll happen quickly and it won't happen the way that you want it to. Let's leave these things behind. Leave these things behind. And as we move forward, I think there is a lot we may have forgotten we needed that we can miss as life moves back into full gear. So here's three things to be intentional about starting up again as we get our lives back on track. Things to restart. First, let's restart our discipline. Restart our disciplines. Our disciplines. Some of us got more discipline than ever last year in some areas of our lives. Maybe you worked from home, and so you had to have more discipline around your job than ever just to make sure that it was getting done. You probably discovered that you could do your job if you were working from home. You know, hey, you know what? I can do this in 30 hours a week and have 10 more hours for fun. Oh, yeah. I talked to a few people that were like, I don't want to go back to the office because I got, I got to work more if I go there. It's <laughs> like, well, all right. Uh, Maybe for you, maybe you, you had to gain more discipline because you learned that at home it's a lot harder to get things accomplished with all the distractions and the family and the children and the snacks and, and outside and nobody watching over you. Maybe you picked up a, a habit in the last year that you've had a lot of discipline around like working out or exercising or maybe you had to exercise at home which required discipline. Maybe you started reading books which requires discipline, but for most of us, a lot of the disciplines that we had established before 2020 fell by our wayside as our schedules were constantly shifting and changing. For parents whose kids were suddenly home, having daily disciplines was a dream left far behind in our past. And among those daily disciplines that many of us lost or couldn't keep up with was our spiritual disciplines. And as we move forward, I believe it's time now for us to restart our spiritual disciplines. Maybe you're starting spiritual disciplines from scratch, all over. But maybe you had been doing a pretty good job. You'd been worshiping, studying your Bible. You'd been getting into a habit of prayer. And, and amidst all the change and the commotion last year, it fell aside. It's time to get it started again. Start with worship. If you've fallen out of discipline in worship and prayer and di scripture study, it's easy to forget how much it blessed you. See, the enemy clouds your mind and tells you that there's not time and he distracts you because he knows how much it weakens you to miss out on your disciplines. But a couple minutes in worship at the start of your day can change the perspective you carry for your entire day. I love in James 4, 8, it says, when you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Proximity to God will change the possibilities of your day. When you get close to him and you let him get close to you, it changes you and it changes your experiences throughout the day. Jesus said in John 4 that God is looking, he's seeking for true worshipers. God is looking for people who worship him. If this last year has left you feeling distant in your faith, maybe it's time for you to stop asking where he is, time to stop looking for him and to start worshiping him and he will come looking for you. Restart worship. Let it lead you into prayer, studying God's word. We've got to restart our spiritual disciplines. How is simple. I'll give you a quick checklist, but... I'll also tell you that if you want to start your spiritual disciplines, right outside that door is a table that says, what's my next step? And if you walk to the table after service, read the sign out loud, someone will begin speaking to you and will give you all the resources. We even have a little booklet that teaches you how to pray step by step. I'm just telling you, we have all that you need. But here, here you go, a quick list to restart your disciplines. First, just make a playlist. Making playlists is fun. If you're old school, do it on a cassette tape. Otherwise, get on Spotify, Apple Music, whatever you use, and build a playlist. I like to go early 2000s worship. I was listening uh, to Celebrate Jesus Celebrate this week, and I was loving it. Yeah, I'm not singing this week. I was told by many people last week not to do that again. 
But, I, but I'll, I'll build a playlist that energizes me. Whatever, whatever it is that you feel connects you in the spirit. I know two songs that if I listen to them, uh, they're about six minutes long each. And by minute four, I'm connected in the spirit every time. My whole world has changed. I, I start worshiping and all of my problems are big. And my God is small. And about maybe around minute 323 is when it happens. It changes. Now my God is big and my problems are small. And it changes things for me. Build a playlist and then get you a little spiral notebook. Get you a little spiral notebook. Prayer is hard, especially if you haven't done it in a while. That's why I write down one or two things. And that's honestly, you know, did you know that prayer doesn't have to be long? The Lord's Prayer, you can say it in, I think, 24 seconds. That prayer doesn't have to be long. You just need to be honest and open with God. You need to get in the practice of conversating with Him, of speaking to Him. And so get in your worship. And as you're worshiping, and as you're singing and as you're, you're praising God, then you want to move from that into speaking to him. Heavenly Father, I want, to, I want to just thank you for who you are, God. I want to worship you for a moment. I want to worship who you are. I want to thank you for all the good things in my life right now. And oh God, you're so good. You're so compassionate. And here's why. I always will write down what I call the heart of my prayer. What's like the biggest thing on my heart that day? And I'll write it down in a couple sentences and I'll, I'll put a I'll put a praise on top of it, like something I'm grateful that God's doing in that area, and I'll put a request underneath it, just what I, what I hope he's going to do. And then I'll just kind of read that, and I'll think about it, and if I have more to say about it, I will. But pray. So build a playlist. Get your spiral notebook. Write down a couple things. And then open the Bible. Get you a, a, a Bible app on your phone. I used the Bible in one year. It's red and white. And I just will read this devotion that it has for me to read that day. Sometimes if I don't have time, I'll put it in my earbuds, I'll listen to it. It's got the audio. I got a British man reading it to me, which makes it sound way more intelligent, makes it sound way smarter, right? And so yeah, I, just simple, start your disciplines. Restart your disciplines, it'll change everything. Restart disciplines. We may need to restart some relationships. We may need to re restart I think the biggest pause for most of our regular lives last year took place relationally because our social lives came to a screeching halt during the stay-at-home order. At one point, I was so desperate to be around some people, I put a fire pit on the property line between my house and the neighbor's house. So I was like, I'm in my yard, you're in your yard, we're socially distant, I'm staying at home, you're staying at home, let's have a seat and have a fire, let's hang out. We, we were starved for relationships for a long time there. Our social lives stopped. Our life groups here at the church went online. Our kids went to school online. We started working from home. Those of us who didn't lose our jobs altogether were working at home. And instead of gathering together here on Sundays, we began to meet online. And we use the word online community a lot as a culture. Uh, but what we have online will never, can never, could never replace a real, physical, present community. It just won't. Content cannot be church. And the way that we can gather online and, and speak to one another and Zoom to one another and whatever else will never replace what it feels like to have somebody sit across the table from you. I'm grateful for all of the technology that allowed us to stay connected last year. It was incredible. It really was. It is amazing that we were able to stay as connected as we were in a year like that. However, you cannot go on living your life that way because it's not the same. You were created to live in relationship. You were made for it. You need it. Adam was in the garden in the physical presence of God, but he still longed for relationship with another human being. God looked at him, and in Genesis 2.18, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And yet, there we were for a whole year, many of us, alone. Some of us more alone than others. Maybe you live alone. You didn't quarantine with your family. Maybe you and your family uh, didn't see another soul for months. But it is not good for man to be alone. Studies are showing that the rise of mental health issues we're seeing now largely has been caused by the isolation many have endured. You were created to go through life in community with others. There may be as things have changed, you've let one or two relationships back in, and, and that's been great. It's been good. 
And maybe because of that, you're, you, you've got one or two relationships. And after, after being so starved for community, you, you're feeling like this is pretty good and you don't really need to engage in life groups. You're not going to commit to getting back into the life of the church because you've realized that you can get by and feel healthy in a smaller community. And so maybe that's where you've settled. I understand that. But I, I want to tell you as your pastor today that that's not enough. Because you don't just need to restart community. You need to restart your purpose. Number three, restart purpose. Look at what the church is. In the, in the earliest formation of the church, I want you to know that in 2013, my wife, Rael, and I sat in a tent praying about this church, thinking about starting this church. It was three years before we would ever start it. And we just said that we want to form it on the foundation of this. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together. And they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts and praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is so important because when I look at this picture of the church, what I notice first is that they don't talk about the preacher at all, which is offensive to me. It's like, how dare is this supposed to be about me? It's not. It's not about the preacher. It's not about how good the production is. It's not about what kind of content we can create. The, the, what the Bible paints as a picture of what the church is supposed to look like is a picture of real community. People doing life together, breaking bread together, celebrating what God is doing together. They, they, there was teaching and there was growth and learning and discipleship happening in those ways. But then there was also just a lot of food being shared, a lot of life being shared. The local church, the idea of what we are was built on the idea of people really going through life alongside one another. Because when community like that exists, it draws people in. It says people were being added to their number every day, not because of how insightful they were able to be on their social media presence. No, it was the people living life together that were drawing people in. People are desperate for it. And when they see it, they want to be a part of it. It says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Don't miss this. You were made to live your life in a community that is centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you live that way, it attracts other people who can then be rescued from all the hurt and the pain and the loneliness and the bitterness and the emptiness that they've been living in. They can be saved and transformed by the very same message that changed you. That's how this is supposed to work. That's where you find your purpose. So if we decide that we're okay with the three friends that we have, and we stop engaging ourselves into the community of the church, then we're leaving behind the people who are desperately in need of what it is that we have. Never take a step forward in life without reaching back and pulling up whoever is behind you. That is what makes life worth living. That is what it means to discover your purpose and make a difference. I believe it is time for us to restart our purpose. Our purpose. Your purpose is to glorify God and to serve others. We can't forget about the others. We can't forget about the ones who are behind us. I started this church because I remember what it felt like to not feel like I belonged anywhere, to not feel like I fit in anywhere, to feel afraid and alone and lost. And I don't, 
I don't live that way anymore. I'm changed. I'm transformed. I'm rescued by the gospel of Jesus Christ and by the community of the local church. And so it is my mission. It is my life's purpose to do everything that I can to find as many people who are in the place I was in and bring them to the place I am now. That's what we are as a church. It's time for us to start our purpose again. Jesus says that this is the most important thing that we do. He said, people are going to know that you're my disciples by how well you love one another. He said, the most important command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The kind of community you were made for isn't closed. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a membership cap. It doesn't say, no, I'm good. I've got enough friends. I don't really have the relational capacity for anyone else in my life right now. I don't really know. I don't, I can't, I don't really want to be around somebody else. I don't, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm good. I get all the relationship I need from these friends that I have. And I need you to remember that there's people in this room, there's people in our city who don't have what you have. They don't have the community. They don't have the friends. And for not just the last 16 months, but for a decade, they've been alone. And they've been starving for somebody to see them and to know them and to offer them hope and peace and a community to go through life with. And if we've got it, we've got to share it. We've got to bring as many people into it as we can. We just have so much to offer everyone who is on the outside looking in. We have hope. We have peace. We have joy. We have restoration. So many of us have people that we can go through life together with that we met right here in the church. Praise God. That's what it looks like. Don't forget to bring someone else in. Build new relationships. Get on the dream team. Serve people. Serve alongside people. Help us create the kind of community that exists in Acts chapter 2. And when you see someone on the outside looking in, open up your arms to them and invite them into it. Serve, Serve in kids' ministry. Make someone feel wanted in our community by loving their children. Go be a part of a life group. Make a new connection. Be an includer. Be an inviter. Be a recruiter. Do it because it is what we were created to do. There are some things that are gone and aren't coming back. Some things that don't need to come back. Some things hopefully we can forget about forever. But there are some things that we need to bring back. We need to to be mindful of. We need to get started all over again because they're so important to us. If you're here today and you've kind of always felt like you were on the outside looking, and maybe that's you. I'm talking about, you, 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 you've been hungry for community. You've never been so isolated in your life. You're tired of it, and you're drawing a line in the sand, and you're saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to step out of the isolation I'm living in. If that's you today, I want you to know that here at this church, in the church, that there is free access to the greatest family you could ever be a part of. And at the head of that family is the most perfect father that has ever been. He sacrificed his son for you that you could have a relationship with him so that you could be a part of all of this. And all you have to do to enter into that relationship is just say, yes, I accept. Thank you for this gift and step into it. And if you're ready to do that today, every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just say this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my mistakes. Forgive me for trying to do it on my own. I believe in you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done for me. And I give my life to you. All that I am from this moment forward, I am yours. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.